Praise God. Let's thank them tonight. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Let's turn in our Bibles, 1 Samuel chapter 30. And we're going to read uh, from verse 1 to 8. Just as you're turning there, in 1966, the Arno River in Florence, Italy, flooded and killed uh, many people and damaged and destroyed thousands of masterpieces, uh, you know, of, of artwork and rare books. And the people refused to simply throw away the damaged masterpieces. They began to uh, establish committees. They organized uh, uh, different groups to do restoration. Money was donated. Uh, new methods of conservation were uh, devised and laboratories set up to restore these masterpieces. Uh, and as a result, many of the works that were damaged that seemed to be damaged beyond repair were able to actually be re repaired and, and restored back to their former glory. And with that in mind, we want to look at our text because in the text we're going to read, David and his men have lost their way uh, a little to say the least and life has dealt some unexpected blows and really has damaged them. But God's word to him is that you shall recover all. So let's read it beginning in verse 1 of 1 Samuel 30. So this night happened when David and his men came to Ziglag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag, attacking Ziglag and burnt it with fire, and had taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city, and there was a uh, and it was burnt with fire, and their wives, their sons, their daughters uh, had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him uh, lifted their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. Uh, and David's two wives, uh, uh, eh, eh, Ahinamah, the Jezreelites and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, uh, had, had been taken captive. Now David was in great distress, uh, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, uh, every man for his sons and daughters. Uh, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Then David said to Abitha, the, the, the uh, priest, uh, Ahimelech's son, Bring, uh, please, the ephod here to me. And Abathar brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue the troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered and said, Pursue, for you shall utterly overtake them. You surely overtake them and will uh, without fail recover all. Then jump down to verse 16. It says, And when he had brought him down... Uh, there they were spread out uh, over all the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil which they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. Then David attacked them from twilight until the evening of the next day. Not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who rode camels and fled. So David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away and David rescued his two wives uh, and nothing of theirs was lacking, either small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything which had been taken from them. Uh, David recovered all. Amen. Let's pray. Father, tonight we ask, um, God, that your Holy Spirit, Lord, would plant uh, uh, the Word of God into our hearts tonight, God, that you would give direction, guidance, help. Uh, uh, God, lay the Word of God up in store, Father, for days ahead also. God, we ask it uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to look firstly at needing recovery. You know, a fact of life is that things don't always go well. And uh, there are the normal battles of life that have nothing to do with our own doing. They come even when we're doing everything right. Uh, the children of Israel are on the way to the promised land and they're attacked by the Egyptians, uh, Balak, the Amalekites, Bashan. Uh, uh, unexpected problems can arise when you're right in the middle of the will of God, uh, doing what you're meant to be doing, believing God. Uh, if you remember the Apostle Paul, 
uh, uh, was going to Rome and he's on a ship. He's in the middle of the will of God. Uh, but even there, he finds the ship sinking uh, and they're shipwrecked on the island of Malta. But then there's other self-inflicted wounds and self-inflicted problems. And it's possible to cause our own problems. How many have ever caused and created their own problems? And uh, the text that we're reading, they were vulnerable in Ziglag because of their own disobedience to God. And unbelief had caused them to leave the will of God. They'd ended up joining uh, with the enemies of God's people. And it's possible to have problems and issues in our own life and troubles that are created by our own making, our own decisions, our own choices. If you remember Jonah running from the will of God and a storm comes, uh, but it was a man-made storm. I remember a lady in our uh, church numbers of years ago uh, came to see me and she said, Pastor, why is my life like this? And, uh, you know, she's expressing her troubles and woes. And, and I never like to say, I told you so. But I remember looking at her and I was thinking, you married an unbeliever that I counseled you not to marry. You come to church now once a month and you stopped tithing two or three months ago. And so she's wondering, why is life like this? How many know we can bring problems on ourselves? And when trouble comes, it usually produces, whether it's just issues that come that are no cause of our own or things that we have caused, either way, they usually produce emotions. Verse 4 of our text, it says they wept. Verse 6 says that David was distressed. Verse 6 again says they were bitter in soul. The word distress means to be narrow or squeezed. He's in a place, he's feeling incredibly pressured. Bitter of soul means to be hardened or we can allow the circumstances that that we're in uh, and how we feel to harden us. And those emotions tend to distort our thinking, our decision making. It's interesting in in Exodus 6, 9, Moses is speaking to the children of Israel But the Bible said they didn't listen to him because of their discouragement uh, and their cruel bondage. How many emotions can really affect our judgment? Common mistake is we can be tempted to make life-altering decisions in the midst of despair. It's always a worrying thing when someone comes and says, Pastor, it's, it's, uh, it's all terrible and this is what I've decided to do. Because the last place you should ever make a major decision is when life is in turmoil we tend not to make good decisions when we're upset verse 6 they spoke of stoning David they're going to attack uh, 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 and attack is uh, attacking is a common symptom of people that are upset when people get upset they attack their spouse They attack their children, they attack uh, uh, friends, they can attack people at church. uh, uh, It really does, when we get emotionally stirred in times of difficulty and struggle, it really does change us. And in attacking David, they were going to turn away from the very person who had brought good to their lives. You know, I've known people in time of crisis, and uh, things have happened, circumstances uh, And the response is, uh, they stop reading their Bible. They stop praying. What's the use? They stop perhaps coming to church. And they turn away from God, the very one who's able to help them, the very one who's helped them in the past and got them to where they were. uh, Amen. He's the one they get angry with and turn against. And if we allow emotions to carry us away, we can make some very serious decisions very bad choices. During World War II, there was a Jewish philosopher, Walter Benjamin, who had fled across Europe from the Nazis. After weeks of running and hiding through occupied France, he reached his longed-for destination, which was Spain. But on the, way, on the day that he arrived the Spanish, at the Spanish border, uh, which was known to be open to people that were coming in, When he got there, he found it closed. And in despair, Benjamin took his own life. 
But the border was reopened the very next day. The closure was only a temporary contingency plan. And so here's a man who makes a drastic decision in an emotional moment, uh, and it was a completely insane decision. And we can do that when we're in difficult circumstances. But we serve tonight, secondly, a God of recovery. We have to be convinced that God is a God of recovery and restoration. I mean, if there's one thing, if you and I are to make the distance, everyone has the thought, I want, to make, I want to ensure I make heaven my home. One of the things that is desperately needed in every life is an absolute conviction that we serve a God of recovery and a God of restoration. His heart is for recovery. He wants to help us recover. He wants us to be restored in life. Psalm 23, 3, he restores my soul. Ruth 4 and verse 15, he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life. Jesus' ministry uh, was one uh, of restoration, making the sick whole, restoring back uh, what was missing. Verse 8 of our text, uh, you shall without fail recover all. To recover implies being helped again. I mean, no, we serve a God who's not just, he doesn't just give us one chance. We don't just have the one opportunity or the one uh, time to uh, do what's right. Uh, it's not just if you lose your way and things go bad, it's over. I know in my own life, after I was saved a year, I did my very best to escape from God. Yet God in His grace, uh, I remember running to the other side of the world from Australia to Europe, uh, and I remember God uh, working and working and working uh, for weeks and weeks and weeks, uh, seeking to restore and bring back to my life what God wanted to do. Job, his latter end was greater than his first. Jeremiah, we read in verse chapter 30, verse 17, for I will restore health to you and heal you of your wounds, says the Lord. You know, God's grace is an amazing thing. It, uh, God's willing to help us recover when we've contributed to our own problems. How many of you have ever heard the expression, you made your bed, you can lie in it? Well, how many know God's not like that? We can make our bed, we can make mistakes, and God will come and His heart is for restoration and recovery. David, in the situation he's in, he's there because of unbelief. He's there because of disobedience. And the people who were with him went along with it. But God doesn't say, you know, uh, uh, I help people recover, but not if they cause their own mess. Then they deserve it. Many good people have that view. I've sat with good people. And they've said, why would God want to help me? Why would God want to restore this in my life? Why would God be interested in helping? Because it's all my fault. I've brought this all on myself. So in their mind, because of that, they feel that God wouldn't restore or perhaps wouldn't help them. But God's heart is for those who need to be recovered. God identifies himself as the God of Jacob. He identifies himself as the, the God of the schemer and deceiver, someone who caused their own mess. God says, I'm their God. Failure doesn't have to be final. Lamentations 3.22. It is of the Lord's mercies that were not consumed because His compassions fail not. They're new every morning. Greater is thy faithfulness. You know, the word compassions means tender love, mercy, and pity. So God has actually moved. How many have ever seen someone who's in a situation of their own doing and you feel for them? They've caused it, they've brought it on themselves, uh, decisions, choices, uh, uh, insane actions. Uh, and you look at them and you see them in a place where they're hurting and they're in pain. Uh, and how many know if we feel compassion, how much more God, the Bible said, if, if we being evil know how to give, give good gifts to our children, how much more God uh, with his tender love, mercy and pity is moved by the plight of our lives whether we're in a situation of our own doing or not, he seeks to recover and rescue us. Verse 8, it said, you shall without fail recover all. Think of who he's talking to. They're in zigzag, as we said, because of their unbelief. They're there because of disobedience. They'd gone off trying 
uh, 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 to join in, in with the very people that were fighting God's people. The Bible is a record of God helping people recover. We know Jonah was rescued from the belly of a whale and allowed to go on to fulfill the will of God in Nineveh. Abraham disobeyed God, went down to Egypt, but went on to a great destiny. Peter denied the Lord, but was recommissioned and brought back to a place of usefulness. Joel 2.25 said, I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent against you. Haggai 2.9, the glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. Uh, and in this place I will give peace, uh, says the Lord of hosts. You know, there was a missionary in St. Louis uh, Silver School uh, who visited St. Louis Silver School in uh, Baguio City in the Philippine Islands. And he, brought, he had bought a silver money clip uh, with a distinctive design on it, and he had carried it and had it for 24 years. But one day as he was using it, he broke uh, the clip. And then he took the two pieces to the, uh, uh, back to the silver school in Baguio City. He showed the pieces to one of the workers. And after examining the pieces for a minute or so, he looked up and said, I designed this clip. The man who was looking at it said, I actually designed this clip. I made all of these that were ever made. Uh, the missionary asked, well, can you fix it? And the artist said, I designed it, I made it, of course I can fix it. And how many know God is the same with us? We are his workmanship. He created us, uh, formed and put together a destiny and a plan for our life. And no matter how broken we may get to in life, no matter how broken areas of your life can be, he is the creator, the maker, and he is able to come. He knows exactly how to bring restoration and recovery. So I want to look then at recovering all. In our text, we see a strategy for recovery and restoration. And very simply, just a number of very simple things is don't fight with the wrong people. Amen. When you're hurting, when you're in pain, when things have gone wrong, don't fight with the wrong people. The people in our text were going to stone David. He could have defended himself. He could have retaliated. Uh, he could have become embittered after all that I've done for you. Uh, uh, but they weren't the problem. It was the Amalekites were the problem. And remember, we have an adv adversary in the devil uh, who is the problem. Amen. So don't, in, when, when, when you get yourself in a situation, when things are hard, when you're in a difficult place, whether it's your own doing or not, uh, make a decision. I'm not going to fight with people. Get focused, secondly, on God. In crisis, we often turn our attention the wrong way. We get focused on our problem. We get focused on perhaps people that have affected us. We get focused on ourselves. Uh, but David, in our text, chose to focus on God. said, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. That's a personal responsibility. No one can do it for us. You know, thank God for encouragers. But how many know encouragement is not enough? You personally uh, have to seek God for yourself. Time of trouble, time of crisis, time of difficulty, uh, when the wheels have fallen off, when the ship's breaking up, uh, amen, uh, we appreciate encouragement, we're glad for friendship, uh, but none of that is going to be able to restore. You need God, uh, and you need to seek God for yourself. David was able to encourage himself in the Lord his God. And one of the things that helps is to remember the testimony of those that have gone before. I was thinking of David. He would have known of Abraham and the recovery of Lot. He would have known of Joseph and how he recovered from everything that had been done to him. He would have known his great-grandmother, Ruth, and looked, uh, who had looked after Naomi. And when all Naomi's hopes lay in shattered pieces... Naomi was told by those around her in Ruth 4, verse 15, those words we read a moment ago, and may he be to you a restorer of life. When everything, when it seemed like everything was destroyed, how I many know we in our mind have an idea of how damaged something can be before it can be restored again? It's like, well, you know, that could be restored, that could be restored. But a lot of times in our mind, we look at something, we think, you know, this is beyond repair. This can't be fixed. 
This is permanently broken. This will never be the same again. God is able to, for, for uh, uh, Naomi, she's there. Uh, uh, her life is basically in ruins. If you remember, she said, don't call me uh, uh, Naomi, call me Mara. Uh, I, I'm bitter. I've, I went out full. I've come back empty. Uh, and then God is able to restore to her uh, her joy, a future that she thought would never be possible. Restoration also involves repentance. We need to choose to change our minds, and in changing our minds, it'll change our actions. He says, shall I pursue? It implies a submission to the will of God. Remember, he's been doing, his, uh, he's had his own plans, he's joined himself to the enemy, uh, but he comes to a place where there's real repentance, and his attitude is, God, I'll do what you want me to do. And restoration involves choosing to believe God. The key is not how we feel. The key is not how does it look. But the key is what does God say about restoration? 1 Samuel 30 verse 8, David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, pursue, for you shall overtake them and without fail recover all. You need to make a decision to trust God about recovery. You know, there's people here tonight that are sitting here in this service. There's things perhaps that are broken in your life. You know, life may generally be going, but there's areas that have been broken. And it's almost like a feeling that, well, that's just the way it is. Just, we'll just go on with that. You need to believe God. You know what, God, you can recover this. If you can raise the dead, if you can make dry bones live again, if you can call things that aren't as though they were, God, you can touch this area of my life. You're a restorer. We need to also understand that recovery and restoration takes a little time. It'd be nice if it was all instant. One prayer, one altar call was all changed. But our text says in verse 17, Then David attacked them from twilight until the evening of the next day. It takes some time to see things recovered takes time. It's not a one-moment repentance. Uh, it's believing God day after day. It's trusting in God. It's drawing near to God. Uh, and over time, God will do a miracle. Great encouragement here in our text is God helps us supernaturally. Verse 18, they shall recover all. God provides what we need for victory. If you remember in our text, uh, if you know the whole story, they meet an Egyptian slave who's able to guide them uh, directly to the Amalekites. He showed them the way to victory. Uh, and the battle works in our favor because of God. God is able to cause supernaturally things to begin to transpire, to bring back together that which is broken in your life. You know, when we fight battles, when things are broken and we have to fight and try and recover, generally people think of a negative. It's just like, you know, I, I, it's, it's never going to be quite the same. You know, when they went after to recover in our text, when the battle was over, they'd gained more than they had before. They'd gained everything back plus some of the Amalekite spoils. 2 Corinthians 4.17, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working a far greater exceeding and eternal weight of glory. In our text, as I said, they recovered their stuff, but they recovered a whole lot more. You know, I've had things in life that have been broken, and in the recovery, I've actually gained more than if they'd never been broken. God has been able to do a work, and that's the nature of God. His recovery, the latter house being greater than the former. You know, there's a great illustration, and I close with this, of Naaman Strzok, who is pastoring a church in, a, uh, in one of our churches in the city in, of uh, Pomona in California. And I'll, I'll read the testimony about it. It said they had just had a glorious outreach on the 4th of July. They took their service to the park and had 2,000 people show up uh, in the course of the night, which is pretty amazing. Had 42 people saved. He got up the next morning and someone had stolen the borrowed generator out of their back garden. He couldn't afford to replace it, so he drove around the city trying to find maybe someone had taken and dumped it. And uh, finally he went to prayer. 
He said at prayer, he thought of the axe head that was uh, borrowed and he prayed, if you can float an axe head, you can float a generator. His wife, at the same time as he was praying, called and said, I, want to, uh, uh, I don't want to sound super spiritual, but I thought of the axe head that was borrowed. So they agreed together and left it with the Lord. An hour and a half later, the police called and asked if he uh, had lost a generator. Naaman had filed a report right away when it had been stolen, and uh, he could describe it. He did, and the officer said, I'm standing right by it. He said, someone found it in a deserted house and felt it didn't belong there, so he called the police. Naaman got the guy's name. He got the generator back, and the guy who found the generator uh, wants to come to church and give his life to Christ. So sometimes out of brokenness out of something that's not good and we think you know what that this is just horrible at best it'll just come back to what it was like before you need to believe that what God restores is better than what was there before what God brings back I've watched people backslide and I've watched God restore them again and when they're restored you begin to look at their life and say you know what your life is far greater. Your depth of revelation and understanding of the grace of God is far greater than it ever was before. God can do a greater work in restoration. So whatever is broken in your life, whatever area, if you're praying for someone, perhaps a backslidden son or daughter, maybe there's an area of your personal life, whatever it is, uh, amen, we need to see the possibilities that God reveals in his word. God is an incredible restorer, rebuilder, He can do what we have given up on. And so what we need to do is we need to fix our eyes upon him as a restorer of broken things. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Amen. As we're here tonight.